Hi everyone, welcome to this special webinar where we'll be discussing why digital health is now more important than ever and how it is poised to accelerate in response to the coronavirus global pandemic. My name is Tim Mackey and I'm the uh, Director of Healthcare Research and Policy at UCSD Extension. I'm also an Associate Professor at UC San Diego School of Medicine. My background is primarily in global public health and technology, and I'll be giving a brief overview of digital health, how it is being leveraged against uh, the coronavirus outbreak, and I'll also be discussing some of our own research using big data and machine learning to address specific challenges associated with this pandemic. Joining me on this webinar is Dr. Daniel Hatters, Managing Director of Healthcare Technology at Nextcubed. Dr. Hatters is a successful entrepreneur, advisor, and an investor, and oversees a portfolio of digital health companies. And he will be discussing the overall impact of COVID-19 on the business environment for digital health, and also provide a few use cases uh, from startup companies working on specific COVID-19 related solutions. I also note that this webinar was supported by UC San Diego uh, Extension Digital Health Certificate, uh, which both myself and Dr. Hatters are instructors. So first, what is digital health? Importantly, the wide scope and scale of digital health modalities and technology types actually makes it really difficult to define. Uh, but one definition comes from an organization called HIMSS, which is a large uh, data and healthcare informatics association that recently stated that the healthcare industry is on the verge of a new age of what we call digital health. Another definition comes from the World Health Organization, which states that digital health is the use and scale of digital health solutions that can revolutionize how people worldwide achieve higher standards of health, access services to promote and protect their health and well being. Most importantly, the WHO ties digital health into broader social goals, uh, some of those uh, outlined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which focus on improving the health of all people and also improving equity, including universal health coverage. So importantly, in digital health, there are many modalities, and some of these may be more familiar to people because you're using them every day. But some of the main forms of digital health come in the, in the form of mHealth, which is the use of mobile phones for delivering health services and information, digital medicine, which is the intersection between mobile, computational, and connectivity, including genomics, precision medicine, the process of tailoring the medical experience to an individual patient, the quantified self, which are people who always track data about themselves, their health care, their health behavior, and want to understand better how their health is impacted by their own individual actions. And telemedicine, which we'll be talking about later on in this webinar, which is really the delivery of healthcare remotely using technology. In order to better understand digital health, it's also good to look at the different technology typologies that are used. So we talked about mobile, there's a lot of gamification, so the use of games and uh, things that you know, encourage people's behavior in different ways. A lot of uh, discussion about communication, sensors, uh, 5G, a lot of uh, internet of things, devices that connect and impact healthcare. Robotics is another space within digital health. A lot of the work that I do is in social media, so the impact of social media on health behavior and how we can communicate to people. Lots of data visualizations that are really exciting that we'll talk about in the context of the coronavirus outbreak. Some frontier technologies, such so as 3D printing and blockchain that are kind of new technologies that we really haven't proven yet, but are on the horizon. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and AI and big data, which are another big area in all types of data fields, but are specifically emerging in healthcare. But the difference between these technology types used in other uh, industries is the healthcare goals we have of utilizing these technologies for, for good health outcomes. And so some of the main ones are improving disease diagnosis, you know, improving prevention and management of healthcare issues, and also uh, you know, enhancing patient safety. Another big issue is making medicine more participatory uh, and having a shared decision, decision process where patients get more access to data and that informs the healthcare and they can make shared decisions with clinicians and increasing health equity and access. However, there are some challenges in this gray box here, which talks about the cost considerations, uh, data privacy and ethics, a big space within digital health that is, is slowly emerging and where there's a lot of scholarship but there's still no framework of how we deal with ethics when it comes to digital health uh, innovation. Uh, the evidence base. So we have to show that this, these digital health solutions actually work. 
And sometimes that's very difficult because we don't have robust studies to test if uh, the technology is good for your health or potentially not good for your health. Uh, reimbursement and financing, getting these technologies actually paid for, which is a big challenge for a lot of startup companies and other companies getting in this space. But some of the biggest areas we can improve healthcare are things like home care, uh, improving population health, not just individual health, and again, uh, really making medicine more precise to the individual. So a lot of people understand digital health within the context of technology that has been mainstreamed. So things like a Apple Watch, which I'm wearing right now, uh, Fitbits, um, a lot of different apps that people can buy and use, which are many, and that's how people interface with digital health on a daily basis. Uh, also interesting is that so many companies are now in the digital health space and calling themselves digital health companies. A local company here in San Diego called ResMed is a medical device company, but now calls itself a digital health company. 23andMe, a genomics company, also a digital health company that talks about how you can identify uh, things that may be related to your health risks. Uh, examples of big companies like Microsoft and HealthVault who weren't successful, who tried to get into digital health and electronic health records, but weren't able to. And then big companies like Amazon that are now pivoting into the healthcare space, particularly in pharmacy. There's also a lot more scholarship, which is very interesting from an academic perspective. So before, you know, 10 years ago, it was hard to place digital health content in a journal because a lot of journals didn't really care about it too much. Now we have major journals like the JMIR series, uh, Digital Health, uh, the Lancet Digital Health that are launching these digital medicine and digital health journals, recognizing the fact that this is an emerging area of scholarship. And of course, uh, one of the biggest developments from a policy perspective has been the World Health Organization issuing a WHA, which is the World Health Assembly, where they make decisions, a resolution saying that digital health is now super important to global health. And uh, working previously at the WHO, I can tell you getting a resolution passed by all its member states is a very difficult and long process. So this is recognition by the um, UN specialized agency in, in, in charge of all public health, saying that digital health is now a core area that they have to look at. And they're concerned about things like, you know, making sure people are trained on digital health applications, having the infrastructure to run them, and also making sure that they improve equity and are deployed across all countries, not just the US. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this space is that different forms of technology are going through their own cycle of um, implementation and innovation. So as you can see from this graph that's from Gartner, uh, a lot of the technology that's more mature in the digital health space is in the context of electronic health records, things that we did maybe 10, 20 years ago. And some technology is just maturing, such as virtual health assistants, which are really at the very beginning of uh, this innovation trigger that Gartner uses. And this is broken down into different forms of digital care delivery, real-time health systems. So it's really uh, different types of digital health technology can mature at different rates. But the primary question we have now is, in the context of the coronavirus, is how will the coronavirus accelerate some forms of digital health technology and pick winners and losers in healthcare? And it's uh, my opinion that uh, digital health will be one of those industries that will accelerate, not be hampered by COVID-19 because it has so much benefit and utility to addressing this pandemic. So at the beginning of this digital health kind of timeline, we had this early period of health information technology, which was really focused on electronic health records, uh, the implementation of those in health systems. And then we had a big push in the telehealth, telemedicine space as well. When we get into this more modern digital health era, we're talking about mHealth issues, big data in healthcare using cloud computing and machine learning, and then other frontier technologies, as we mentioned, around blockchain. So now that the coronavirus outbreak is happening, what will happen with this timeline and how will it accelerate certain types of technology and hopefully modernize the way we do healthcare? So now we're going to pivot into a discussion of the coronavirus and why, in my, in my opinion, this is the first pandemic we've had in what we call a post-digital era. So to provide a little bit more context to what's going on in the global health space, uh, we're seeing an unprecedented number of different outbreaks in near pandemics just in the last decade or so. 
Uh, people forget, but in 2002, our first SARS outbreak was considered the first uh, near pandemic uh, in the post-globalization era. So this is an era where a disease can now spread all throughout the world just from one hotel in Hong Kong. And um, travel, trade, and the interconnection uh, and uh, of trade and health is, is really a core component of why these outbreaks are now going to be global outbreaks. But soon after that, in 2009, we had the H1N1 swine flu, which was a global pandemic, and also was in an era where you know, information was changing and it was disseminated more rapidly. But we have other concerns that are ongoing, such as avian flu and the multiple outbreaks of Ebola we've had in West Africa. So what we're going to see in the future are more outbreaks, unfortunately, more global health emergencies. And these are only the ones we're talking about in the context of emerging infectious diseases, whereas other things like antimicrobial resistance are ongoing issues that we should be prepared for as well. And to give a better context to the globalization and digitization of outbreaks, a lot of people are comparing this outbreak to the Spanish flu of 1918. But in context, again, during the Spanish flu, the radio crystal oscillator was just invented. Commercial radio was just beginning, and there was no electronic TV. During SARS, we had our first major outbreak, again, in the globalization era. But there was actually no Facebook at that time, and social media was just emerging. With H1N1, the smartphone market was rapidly expanding. The Apple App Store launched in 2008, a year before. Uh, so this was a period where technology was definitely advancing. We were getting more interconnected with uh, the way we communicate uh, on the internet and through these platforms, but still relatively in the early stages. Now, in 2019, and uh, when the coronavirus outbreak was first identified, we have 53% of the world's population on the internet. And Facebook has 2.5 billion monthly active users, which would make it the largest country in the world if you counted their users as their population. So getting back to our digital health kind of framework, let's look at these technology typologies again, and then map it back to why they're important in the context of certain pandemic response approaches. So there's a lot of interesting work on COVID-19 around mobile and gamification. One example in the top left here is the use by the Chinese government of mobile devices to do digital contact tracing and also use gamification to give you a clear if you're a cleared case or not, or you can go somewhere, et cetera, with QR codes. Uh, AI and big data, we'll talk about this a little bit more. We can use a lot of big data and artificial intelligence to do image recognition, such as things that are being done at UCSD, to detect pneumonia earlier. Robotics, uh, ensuring that social distancing and healthcare is safe by using robots in an acute care setting, which is done being done in Italy right now. And then devices uh, tracking fever and temperature for contact tracing. So another example of device use in this space. The other space that's really getting popular is actual data visualization, and we'll show some examples of that. And then social media, uh, with the example of the WHO, which is working with Facebook and other companies to combat COVID-19 misinformation, which we'll also be talking about uh, in the section where I talk about some of the research we're working on right now. Uh, some of the main reasons why we're using this technology is to change health behaviors. Um, to change people's attitudes about social distancing, about quarantine, about uh, things that will hopefully flatten the COVID-19 uh, curve. Uh, other things like infectious di infection diagnosis, prevention, again, digital contact tracing, which is a big issue, and early alert systems to let us know when clusters of cases may arise and where we have to implement additional public health interventions. Um, a lot of the things that we're dealing with that may be barriers to digital health are the same as well, such as data privacy and ethics, user adoption. Will people actually use these apps that uh, we're creating? And the funding for the implementation in the context of a health emergency. Um, what we're seeing is something uh, that's really fascinating, which is gaining telemedicine adoption because people can't go to uh, their hospitals or see their uh, clinicians. We're also seeing a little bit of a change in the regulatory regime, which can actually improve the implementation of these technologies. And hopefully we'll see a focus on digital public health. So as an example of some of the regulatory changes that are going on, even prior to the coronavirus outbreak, the FDA recognized that digital health technologies had to be treated differently than the traditional approval process for medical devices or drugs. 
So a pre-cert program that certifies a particular manufacturer um, instead of uh, approving the actual product is something that was already ongoing. Now, during the coronavirus outbreak, um, the FDA has a number of different guidance documents that are trying to be reactive to the outbreak and balance this issue of improving access to uh, products that can combat the uh, pandemic and also making sure that uh, there's appropriate risk and safety associated with those products. Um, so they want to balance those issues. And so again, the regulatory environment is likely to change because of the coronavirus and it will likely accelerate the uh, introduction of lots of diff different digital health technologies. Particularly in telemedicine, we're seeing a lot of movement. And I think uh, Daniel will also touch on this. Um, one, CMS has relaxed its, uh, its rules on the scope of practice around telemedicine and some reimbursement areas. So already in the telemedicine space, we're seeing acceleration of policy to ensure that people can get access to services through telemedicine and telehealth. Another quick example of why digital health is really prominent in this COVID-19 discussion is the fact that the single source of information that most people use to understand what's going on with this particular pandemic does not come from a government agency or the WHO. It comes from John Hopkins University and their dashboard, which aggregates information about cases all around the world. And so this is a source of data that now multiple organizations are using, including governments, the media, et cetera. And we know that this dashboard is very helpful in understanding the context of the outbreak. There's lots of data visualizations available on, on platforms like Tableau. Um, this is one from Florida. So there's localized data uh, and analytics that can help us understand the prevalence and severity of the outbreak. Uh, this is a dashboard from the World Health Organization. And again, working at the World Health Organization previously, it was not always easy to get technology adoption within the WHO. So this is a real pivot by the WHO to adopting technology and using it in a way that can inform the global public. Other things like COVID Near You uh, by John Brownstein's group in Harvard uh, are really focused on crowdsourcing information about the outbreak so we understand people who are reporting their symptoms, who are sick, and understanding where cases may be going underreported. And of course, one of the most uh, noticeable uh, examples is the partnership between Apple and Google on digital contact tracing. So here uh, is an example of two companies that are rivals that often don't cooperate with each other, but are coming together to develop tools to ensure that we can do a, uh, adequate contact tracing from a digital perspective using mobile devices and Bluetooth. A lot of issues related to privacy and uh, data protection, but again, a very good example of why digital health is now becoming very important in the context of this outbreak. We also have some examples at UCSD, such as uh, a wearable IoT device, a ring that can track uh, temperature of healthcare workers that is being worked on with the San Diego Supercomputer Center, um, and again, artificial intelligence that enables lung imaging for pneumonia. Now I'm going to pivot real quickly into this last section that talks about some of our ongoing research uh, with my group and why we're leveraging social media as a layer of infovalence. And infovalence meaning using electronic medium to better understand the patterns of disease uh, uh, progression and patterns of disease spread and why this is a very important data layer moving forward. So here's a dashboard we've created where we've collected a number of social media posts, um, over 200 million. And what's happening in this day and age of digital engagement is that people are really talking about their experiences with the coronavirus. So now we have hundreds of millions of conversations related to coronavirus, and we can better hopefully understand what people's concerns are, what their knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors are towards this outbreak. And hopefully that can inform public health interventions and actually lead to evidence-based policymaking. We're also using geospatial analysis to understand what are the demographic and economic correlates associated with communities impacted by COVID-19. That can include things like workforce, labor, uh, things like homelessness, et cetera. So we want to understand which communities are being impacted more or less and identify risks associated with those uh, populations. And that includes overlaying case data from sources like John Hopkins University, 
with our own data layer of how people are talking about coronavirus from a social media perspective. Some of the other studies we've done, including one we've published, is looking at the very early stages of the outbreak in China, in Wuhan. And so what's been very interesting to find out is that people change their behavior and attitudes and their reactions to the coronavirus based on information as it arises. So at the very beginning of the outbreak in China, people didn't know what, what the disease was. And so as information came out that this was not SARS, that this was not you know, a general pneumonia, then people got worried and people started changing their actions and changing their attitudes towards the outbreak, including self-quarantining or maybe even going out and not being as worried. So this is very important information to understand how information dissemination will lead to change in behavior. And unfortunately, one of the last things in the area that we focus on the most in our lab is um, characterizing this parallel infodemic. What infodemic means and how it's defined by the WHO is, is that it's a period when you have an overabundance of information. So it's great that everyone's on social media. It's great that we have so many information sources, but it's kind of overwhelming. And unfortunately, a lot of that information that is being disseminated is not trustworthy or reliable. So right now we're dealing with an infodemic of frauds and cybercrime associated with COVID-19. And this includes things like online frauds, robocalls, phishing scams, and fake products being sold online. So we're using big data and machine learning and data visualization to identify, characterize, and report illegal marketing and online sale of COVID-19 related products. And that includes all types of things. So this is an example here of Dr. Coronavirus on Twitter selling uh, testing kits that are likely not the real testing kit. And we've seen things as weird as blood plasma being sold on the dark web. Um, so there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. And unfortunately, there's a lot of vulnerable um, consumers that may want to test or may want more information or may want a cure, but unfortunately they may be just be getting scammed. And so one of the things we're working on and what we've done is shared some of our information with the FDA and the World Health Organization so that they have that information to inform their own policy making decisions. Next, we are going to transition our discussion to Dr. Hatters. We'll be talking about how COVID-19 uh, re is really positioning digital health to accelerate during and after this pandemic. Thanks, Professor. I appreciate the introduction and I'm excited to uh, be invited to be here today. As Tim mentioned, I'm going to speak today about digital health and COVID-19 from the perspective of someone who was once a scientist, uh, then a company builder, but now an investor. And as serious as the times that we are in uh, are, there's great opportunity on the horizon for digital healthcare. From a human perspective, COVID-19 is arguably the worst global healthcare crisis in at least 40 years since the HIV AIDS pandemic that swept the globe, or probably more, more realistically, 100 years uh, and that being the Spanish flu outbreak uh, that Tim spoke about earlier in, in the presentation. From a financial perspective, the COVID-19 pandemic is the worst economic crisis in at least 10 years since the Great Recession, but more appropriately, probably the last 90 years since the Great Depression. But even though this healthcare crisis and this economic crisis are real, from a digital health perspective, we have the greatest population health opportunity in at least 160 years since the identification that clean drinking water could change public health, or potentially as long ago as 220 years when the smallpox vaccine was pioneered. We sit now on the precipice of a evolutionary change, a, a potential discontinuity in the way that healthcare is delivered. And digital health is at the center of that. And what's interesting is that yesterday for many corporates, for um, uh, many healthcare systems, digital health was a peripheral nice to have. But today, digital health is now a need to have. And so what do I mean about this going from yesterday to today. Well, if you look at these headlines, literally, and maybe more so figuratively, from yesterday, you see 
that only as as you know recently as December 15th of 2019, people were lamenting why has digital health been such a failure, been such a uh, disappointment. In January of last year, we're questioning is digital health writ large as an industry within healthcare, is it a failure, right? And going back 18 and other years, keep on talking about why digital health startups are failing. And part of the reason they were failing is because we were in the early experimental stage. And part of the reason why they were failing is because of the entrenched interest in our current healthcare system that were never going to be moved off of their uh, point of reference until forced to by something like the COVID-19 pandemic. So what do we see today? Literally going from Q4 of last year into Q1, Q2 of this year, we now see these headlines, right? People talking about who led the digital transformation of your company. It's not your CEO, it's not your CTO, it's COVID-19. We're seeing surges in patients using telehealth services that before were something that many people didn't even know that they had access to, right? Teladoc, one of the leading publicly traded companies in this space, has seen a surge in coronavirus uh, appointments. As Tim mentioned previously, Health and Human Services has actually changed CMS, I should be more specific, has changed the rules and the reimbursements even around how telehealth is delivered. And what you see in the lower right-hand corner is even specialists who had tried to stay away from telehealth are now turning into telehealth practices overnight, right? What we're seeing is a generation of change in a quarter of a year. This is unprecedented, right, in the histories of healthcare since some of those events that I mentioned previously. And what's really, really interesting here in this age of COVID is that it's software, not pills, right, not legacy medical devices that are going to pull us through this pandemic and will be there on the other side to reorient what it means to provide healthcare and to receive healthcare. CB Insights recently ran a survey, for instance, if you look at this slide, where they're speaking about in relationship to the current crisis, which technologies moving forward will have the most long-term impact on healthcare. What I wanna pull your attention to is the staggering result here is that 88% of respondents, right? And these are people who are qualified to give an opinion of this space. 88% of them believe that software is going to bring us out of this pandemic, not pills, i.e., you know, new uh, therapeutics like cell and gene therapies, even on the most cutting edge of this, CRISPR and all the technologies that you've seen in the headlines. It's software that's going to change healthcare, not pills. And specifically, I want to double click on remote patient monitoring, which was the super majority of respondents' uh, vision of what the future of healthcare is. So to be more specific, what remote monitoring is, essentially it's moving the point of care from the four walls of a clinic or a hospital system into a patient's home. But remote monitoring is just the beginning. Remote monitoring is simply saying, we're gonna check in with you via maybe a telehealth service or maybe a device that intermittently sends data or provides information to your healthcare providers. Virtual care, which is where the startup scene is actually in the healthcare system, is already past that. Virtual care is the ability to provide remote healthcare interventions at a distance. It's healthcare that is always on. It's on you. It's in your home. It's in your pocket. It means that your health is constantly at the center of what your physician and your health health plan is concentrating on. But because of patient stratification uh, strategies, because of AI, because of data management strategies, it at the same time allows us, while it allows us to monitor patients 24 seven, it also allows physicians to concentrate on the people that need care right now, right? Because in today's world, the reality is too few patients receive enough care, but you have small cohorts of patients that receive too much care, right? And remote patient monitoring, virtual care, and AI, and IoT devices, and advanced analytics solve those issues. 
And that truly is the healthcare of the future. And that's what we see playing out in real time as part of this pandemic. So what I want to point out, though, is that 12 percent that people said that in, in pills and in new therapeutics that are important to bring us out of this pandemic. Well, guess what? Software is there as well. As you can see from these headlines, not only is software replacing the need for therapeutics, but where therapeutics are needed, software is actually making therapeutics. Today, many companies around the globe are now using artificial intelligence to design drugs or repurpose drugs into new indications. They're doing things on computers in literally days, which previously before the, the last five to 10 years at most were things that would take 20 years to accomplish and $2 billion in capital to accomplish. Now with software, we're able to accomplish those same things for a fraction of the time, potentially bringing drugs to market from inception to it being in the pharmacy and potentially as little as five years. And we're talking about the cost to make that happen going from billions to maybe as little as tens of millions to $100 million. Digital health, from an investor's perspective, and this is really important, uh, there's, there's a saying floating around in this space that it's a good time to have been investing in digital healthcare three years ago. Because the folks who were investing in this space early, the folks who were building these companies three years ago, have now been able to establish product market fit, and they've now been able to establish customers, and they've now been, they're now ready to take on this greater burden to serve the healthcare community in ways that frankly weren't available to them until the last quarter. So when it comes from an investor perspective, obviously the returns in the market measured in many different ways are obviously what we're looking at. And just to draw this stark contrast between yesterday's companies, uh, which are oftentimes represented in the Dow Jones Industrial Average versus tomorrow's companies or today's companies, I should better say, represented by a firm like Teladoc that I mentioned earlier. What you can see here is that over the last year, the Dow Jones Industrial that hit their peak around 29,500, now as of yesterday, sits at 23,600 roughly. Now, for instance, look at a company like Teladoc that a year ago sat at a stock price around $50 a share, now sits at a stock price of almost $180 a share, more than tripling its value over the last year in during a market that has seen substantial down uh, declines in the broader market. This is evidence that shows that what's occurring in companies like Teladoc is they built a platform that they knew was the future of healthcare. They started to build product market fit. And now as they've entered 2020, they've now become indispensable to the future of healthcare. While legacy companies from legacy industries have seen any, anything but that occur for them uh, as related to their stock price. So at Repurpose AI, of course, we've been doing this for, lo and behold, about three years now. Uh, so we started building our, our healthcare program in 2017 and investing in the digital healthcare space. And you know, these are a few examples of some of the companies that we've invested in over the last three years that are not only surviving during the COVID-19 pandemic, but are actually thriving. So Repurpose AI is an AI-driven drug discovery company that uses the totality of all the chemistry around all the drugs that are known to bind all the biological targets in the body and uses that information uh, to predict novel drug target binding for drugs that have successfully completed a phase one clinical trial. Once COVID-19 started, the team looked to say, hey, can we participate and potentially drive innovation in this space? And very shortly after turning their attention to COVID-19, they identified drugs predicted to bind ACE2, which may inhibit SARS-CoV-19 related, SARS related infection. And so Repurpose AI is one of these AI drug discovery companies that are completely and fundamentally changing the landscape of what it means to create drugs today and moving forward. Another example in the drug discovery space is a company called Rockstep Solutions. Rockstep Solutions is different from Repurpose AI 
in that what they do is they've used artificial intelligence and advanced software technologies to completely change how research is done in the preclinical setting. And so with COVID-19, what's happened with social distancing is research teams have been forced to go virtual in many cases, or certainly they can't be in laboratories in the same quantities of time that they're used to. Software platforms like Rockstep Solutions enable those teams to collaborate, keep experiments running, even in the absence of humans being in the laboratories, and allows drug development to continue at the pace at least as fast as it was occurring before, if not faster, as teams quickly learn how to utilize these technologies to their, uh, to their advantage. Then we have companies like eCare21. eCare21 recently partnered with Dell to enable this virtual delivery of healthcare that I was speaking about before. eCare21 with their partners has built the infrastructure that remote and virtual care sits on. Right? So you can think of the connected IoT devices, feed data streams into the platforms created by eCare21, which analyzes the data, stratifies the patient data, and then presents it to the, uh, the provider, the physician that's in charge of that patient life, but only at times when the patient is trending in the wrong way. Right, So in this way, you're able to free up the physician's time to spend more time with the sickest patients, while still creating 24 hour coverage of a patient's life. And so obviously this is very important and part of that remote uh, patient monitoring revolution that's occurring. Also that includes firms like Teladoc, for instance. And then we see disease management in different ways. A company like SkillPower recently uh, signed a deal with the Department of Defense to develop a diabetes focused app for uh, folks that are at risk of becoming diabetics and diabetics themselves. And so what you see here is the government buying in because who is most at risk for not just contracting COVID, but uh, developing serious symptoms related to uh, COVID-19? Well, they're folks with pre-existing conditions like diabetes. So it's not just the treatment of COVID that's important today and moving forward, but it's the treatment of these comorbidities, right? And these chronic diseases and skill power has stepped up to partner with the federal government to build those exact solutions. And then finally, you can't forget mental and behavioral health, right? In this world of significant change where 35 million people, I believe at last count in the US have lost their job, where people are having to um, uh, form new norms that they're not used to, where parents are having, you know, in my family, my wife is a physician, I'm a healthcare investor, we have three young kids that are at home that we're now homeschooling. And even the quote unquote most stable of us among us in the population, all of us are dealing with highs and lows on a daily basis. Technology and companies like Porchlight, which connect people in our digital world and help create true human connections in a digital world are helping to change the way mental and behavioral health are thought of, empower us as human beings through this pandemic. And then finally, you have a company like Tribe Health. Tribe Health has created a blockchain blaze HIPAA compliant uh, interoperability platform. When they began the company, they were focused on interoperability related to medical imaging which even today has really been left out of the interoperability rules and regulations, or even the data access rules and regulations that came up during uh, Obamacare and were brought to, to the forefront. Tribe Health has said they're going to solve that problem. But when COVID hit, they said, wait a minute, we can do more than that. We can take our platform and transition it into an end-to-end -end technology solution for the management of COVID, right? From the moment that person, someone thinks they have a symptom to interact with their physician to the point where somebody maybe has a test, either positive or negative, to someone in all their follow-up care. And what's really important here is that Tribe is putting the patient finally at the center of their own healthcare, where it's the patient that's controlling their data. And so all of these things that I'm speaking about, all of these companies, whether it be Tribe Health or Porchlight or Repurpose AI or any of the other number of companies that are in this space. These companies all existed beforehand. And what they found in COVID is the opportunity to shine 
where they've become a part of what must be the future of healthcare rather than a nice to have that people are able to push to the side and maybe even bring on as optics or window dressing for a company to be able to say, yes, we're innovative. Now they must truly be innovative. They cannot no longer pretend to be innovative. And in this, uh, the companies at NextCube, but also writ large uh, at all these startups in the digital healthcare space have found a new calling. And I think what you're going to see is the healthcare system that existed in January of this year, where many folks like me attended the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco, that healthcare system that we were speaking about in January, it no longer exists. And the one that will exist when we end, uh, when we exit this pandemic will be very different. It will be patient centric. It will be virtual. It will be remote. It will be cheaper. It will be faster and it will be available to more people and things like mental health will no longer be stigmatized because all of us are suffering from these conditions in one way or another, or our loved ones are suffering. And so we we entered this one world and we will exit this a very different world from a healthcare perspective. So with that, I'll turn it back over to um, Tim to wrap up today's discussion. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar and thank uh, Dr. Hatters for the case studies he provided and some of the vision that we have for how digital health will look like during and post the COVID-19 pandemic. The one thing I'll close with is that uh, I recently heard a uh, segment on NPR where they were asking uh, college students about what their hope was for the future. Uh, and a lot of them had different answers. And I was struggling at that time to come up with an answer myself. Uh, and then I, one of the things that this uh, process has taught me is that one of the things we can hope for is that human ingenuity and innovation can lead us through this crisis and hopefully bring us a better world in the future. So we hope that digital health will be one of those uh, tools that we use to both improve healthcare and also improve the lives of people and enhance our population health so that we can have a more equitable, safe, and healthy world. So again. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we welcome uh, we welcome any feedback and comments, and look forward to talking to you on another time. Thanks.